Now, Pauling was really an exceptional individual in every way. He never was constrained to laboratory science in the laboratory, but used every public occasion to advance the cause of peace. As a physical chemist, he clearly understood the dangers of thermonuclear testing in the atmosphere. And on one event, a very special invitation to the White House, he led a protest that afternoon. This was on all the national networks. And here you can see him holding a placard. And at the end of the afternoon, straightened his tie and entered the White House for the reception. And it was a glorious event. President Kennedy had invited 49 Nobel Prize winners to the White House. The event, which he later recalled as the greatest concentration of talent and knowledge in the White House, perhaps since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> By the end of the evening, Pauling had convinced Kennedy that a limited test ban treaty was needed. Kennedy, one of his last signed works as president before dying, was in fact the enactment of the limited test ban treaty, which prevented the testing of nuclear arms in the atmosphere and the fallout of de deadly radioactive waste. Another hero as a youngster was Albert Schweitzer, who I've never met, but represented, I think, the epitome of, of medicine for the well-being of the less fortunate. Our Norwegian Lutheran community had a very active medical missionary group. And this was really what drew, drew me to, to medicine. I uh, decided I felt chem chemistry and basic science was probably beyond what I could accomplish. But as a medical doctor dealing with problems of the third world diseases, I could make original contributions. And so when accepted at Johns Hopkins, which is a very special university because it has very large uh, activities in third world medicine, I decided to head east from Minnesota by heading west, viewing a number of places in the uh, far east where cholera and other horrible tropical diseases occurred. Now as a student, and any undergraduates here, I really hope you'll listen to this. As a student, I found it really exceptionally interesting to take the opportunities to work in laboratories. Because reading about science and going to lectures is, is, is wonderful, but putting your hands on the scientific equipment and generating data is, is unmistakably and irresistible. Uh, I joined the laboratory of Pedro Cuatro Casas. Pedro also is retired, living here in San Diego who was a brilliant pharmacologist at Johns Hopkins who was the first to use affinity chromatography in biological systems and did a number of firsts, very important breakthroughs, and recruited a very interesting group of scientists who I found very different from the stereotypical drab scientists that we would see in uh, movies. Included in Pedro's group, shown here, uh, to the left is Gianfredo Puca an Italian actor, unbelievable, a film actor, becomes a scientist. He was also a downhill ski racer and decided he would approach the most important problem any Italian man could address. He was going to solve the molecular basis of femininity. And, and he did. Check it out, Nature, 1970. Puca Sica Nolo Bresciani, isolation of the estrogen receptor by affinity chromatography. So I knew I was in for a really exciting time in this lab, although as debonair as Pedro and Gianfredo were, the rest of the laboratory was somewhat of a mixed group, <laughs> but a very colorful group. In, the, in, our, in, our, in our team, we had uh, Orthodox Jews, a Palestinian activist, a Spanish anarchist, a big wave surfer from Hawaii who happened to be my roommate. And it was my project to undertake the isolation of the toxin causing traveler's diarrhea, something similar to cholera. Now this is a horrible diarrheal disease. It, uh, it, it kills many infants throughout, throughout the developing world. And I found it very heady stuff to work in a laboratory like Pedro's laboratory and make strong molecular contributions. At, at the same time, I have to confess, working on diarrheal diseases is not necessarily good for your social life. I recall at a mixer at Goucher College, a very fine women's college, meeting an attractive young lady, chatting with her, and she asked me, Peter, what kind of medical doctor do you think you'll become? And, and I honestly thought she was ask, hoping I would say radiologist or neurosurgeon, but I, I'm from Minnesota. I said the truth. I said, I'm interested in diarrhea. And <laughs> that was the end of that relationship. But um, in fact, the problems of diarrheal diseases represent a problem of fluid movements. And this is a, something that uh, came back to, to haunt me in my scientific career. And I found, uh, subsequently uh, joining uh, Johns Hopkins as a faculty member, 
decided to work actually on blood diseases because my roommate Van Bennett had joined Tom Pollard's Department of Cell Biology and I was allowed to work with Van for a couple of years before starting my own lab. And in fact, we worked on the RH blood group antigen, something well known but not clinically but not understood at a molecular level. And in the process of working on the RH blood group antigen, we isolated the 32 kilodalton polypeptide, and this is a silver-stained SDS page. Uh, this polypeptide is an antigen in humans, but it's also present in non-human red cells, as you can see. But the purifications contained a slightly smaller polypeptide, which we initially dismissed as a breakdown product, and we subsequently realized was a separate polypeptide, in fact, representing a contaminant, but a very interesting contaminant. And I talked to many scientists and was really quite frustrated. It was very abundant in red cells. It had sequence similarities to a variety of proteins, but we didn't know what it did. Now, one of the things as a scientist and as an academic which is much discussed is the work-life balance. And in our case, this was something that was also very important to us. I, I, I got married to Mary McGill, we have a family, and while the children all knew about what was going on in the lab and loved to visit the lab, we, we made special trips every year because Mary is a, a, a natural biologist and felt the children should all view the national, national parks, a great treasure, and these were really fun family activities. And we did this for several years, and finally, after uh, I think the five, fifth or sixth trip to national parks, we gave the children their choice. Which national park would you like to visit next year? And they immediately yelled, Disney World. <laughs> well, uh, Disney World, as you know, is not a national park, but we compromised. We went to the Everglades, we went to Disney World, and then passed through Chapel Hill, North Carolina, on our ba way back to Baltimore. And consumed with this 28 kilodalton polypeptide, I talked to a number of individuals there. We stayed with Van. And I talked to John Parker, shown here, who was a hematology attending at the University of North Carolina, with whom I'd worked, and who had an exceptionally uh, uh, high quality physiology program where he studied membrane transport. And it was really a conversation with John where the lights went on for the first time when he described this protein of 28 kilodaltons in red blood cells, also present in kidney kidney tubules, with related proteins in a variety of tissues, including the roots of plants. It was John who put it together. He said, these are all water-soluble water uh, tissues, highly permeable tissues. Have you considered this might be the long-sought water channel? Now, I'd, I'd never heard of something called a water channel before. And upon returning to Baltimore, did, did some investigation. In fact, there was a body of literature explaining that water does not freely freely permeate cells and tissues, but must, in fact, in some cases, work through special pores, a somewhat, a, a, something akin to a plumbing system of tissues. And if you think about it, in fact, it's, it's quite obvious there must be special mechanisms so we can all secrete and reabsorb cerebrospinal fluid, aqueous humor, tears, sweat, saliva. And if you don't think that's important, the next time you're on an airliner with a full bladder and the seatbelt light goes on, you'll realize that water transport in terms of renal concentration is really quite important. So we, we, we tested out this idea of John's by expressing this new pr protein in frog eggs. These are from the uh, Xenopus lavis species. Frogs lay eggs in freshwater ponds. They have inherently low water permeability. So the idea is if we express this protein as a water channel, they should be osmotically active. So here we have two oocytes on the left control oocyte and the right an oocyte injected with complementary RNA to the new protein in isotonic culture media and then after transfer to distilled water. And there's an obvious difference. The test oocyte is swollen rapidly and ex exploded and this produced much jubilation in the laboratory. <laughs> That's very special about science. You know, you can really cheer when something works because most of the time things don't work. And this resulted in our first really prominent paper in the journal Science. It made me a huge fan of that journal, which I remain to, uh, a fan to, to, to this day.